So welcome everybody. So I am Julien Pivoto. I work at Inuit as an open source consultant, but I do mainly systems administration, uh, mainly even CentOS systems administration. Uh, I am in the open source software world since 2004, I believe, and I use DevOps. And I use CentOS since 2011, so since when I entered the enterprise world. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Briarty, anywhere under the name Wallapri. So I work at Inuit. We are a big Belgian uh, open source company, which is also active in the Netherlands, in the Czech Republic, and in Ukraine. We do a lot of open source consultancy, development, system administration. We do a lot of different stuff. We are like 60 people. But yeah, this is not a marketing talk. So, <laughs> how do people distribute software? Well, there are a lot of options. There are some people that do it with plain FTP, maybe with SCM, maybe not. People just use also tarballs, sending tarballs by mail or putting them on any location, okay, which is also a possibility. Then you have people that are more advanced, they use self-extracting tarballs. Yeah, you just run that blob file and it inserts everything. Then you have remote code execution, curl pipe bash, which a lot of Ruby man does like because yeah, it's easy. It works on every distribution. Okay, but then I first need to read that bash script to be sure that it will not screw up my system or anything like that. Okay. Then, okay, we have containers. Yes, but that's not the problem. How did you put your software into that container? That's the interesting part. And then you have packages. Well, you can have crappy RPM packages with a lot of stuff into the post and pre scripts, but you can also have nicely written packages, which I hope you have. So this talk is a talk about real RPM packages and repositories. How do you manage your repositories? Every uh, CentOS box has remote repositories. So how do you uh, keep them up to date? Are you using directly the upstream repositories from CentOS? Then what happens when they are not up to date or when they are just down? Does that mean that you cannot deploy new servers because just mirror.centos.org is down? You can also use Ersync to a local uh, <coughs> to a local location in your infrastructure, but then it means that you have no flexibility. You cannot choose to add reposi <coughs> uh, packages in the repositories, remove them, or if a custom <coughs> repository it becomes really crappy, you, this is not really the more efficient way of doing, unless you want to make a bar metal sent to SME or also. Maybe you also use create repo to create a local YUM repositories. Yeah, but this is not something that will get you history or stuff like that. So you, you maybe want something more advanced than that. And there are also some other alternative mRepo reposing that allows you to sync repositories from upstream also. But let's first go back a few minutes into packaging. Packaging has a lot of advantages. Like you have uh, consistency checks when you install a package, then the files matches the checksums. You have dependency resolving, so if you have a tarball, then you cannot specify the different dependencies that are needed for your application. You have repositories, which means that you don't have to put the files into each server when you need to install something. You can have GPG signing, which ensures that the repositories are the ones that were built by, for example, the CentOS team and not, they have not been modified. We have a lot of tools, that's very important, that with a package, you can query the package, you have the RPM command, you have the yum command, you have all the repository related commands that you don't have for a tarball, that you don't have for the rest of the repository tools, of the packaging tools. You have versioning also, you can keep easily the, or install a new version of your package if you want. You can easily roll back if your package is well, well written. You have a unique artifact, one file that you can just put to a repository to install it on every other host. And the last advantage is that 
a package is something that configure, configuration management tools know. Puppet knows how to install a RPM. Chef also. So it's really easy to use RPM package to deploy your applications. But there are some downsides. If you want to write a nice spec file, then yeah, it might take some time to read the RPM book. You, uh, you can have dozens of repositories. I have seen servers when you have a, the custom repository for Postgres, then you have the Hyper repository, then you have a repository for Puppet Labs, then you have a repository for Samba, and yeah, and at the end it's just the jungle of the repositories. You get conflicts between the packages from one repository to another. So, and someone, so sometimes you have a dependency that is nowhere into your repository, so which means you will need to find in which repository that RPM is and add it also. So. But we can work around that. <coughs> I will make a small parenthesis to, small to speak about FPM, Ethic Package Management, which is a small Ruby game that uh, is a command line tool that allows you to easily build a RPM or a DEB or any other stuff from a PyPy archive from a tar files or just from a directory. So if you want to get some of the advantages of RPM, you can just use FPM to build the packages. If you just have a SCM repository that you want uh, to make a RPM out of it, you can just use FPM to make a small RPM. You should not use that if you plan to distribute the RPM, but for internal purpose, it's really a nice tool. So repositories, what is a repository? Well, it's the source of the packages. That's where you will find uh, all the packages you will need, the dependencies also, which means that if they are not up, if you don't have internet connectivity, your infrastructure just does not work. Yeah, it will be running, but if there is an update that, you, that needs to be done, a critical update, then yeah, you cannot do anything because the internet is down. And if you have a broken repository with wrong packages, it's also a big problem for you because you will think you will upgrade your package, but it will just do nothing or remove important files or anything like that. So there are a bunch of challenges. The first challenge is that the, the repositories and the should be part of the CI. The packaging uh, should be part of your continuous integration platform. So if you build the software, you need to have decent tests. You need to have decent, uh, decent jobs that will make your application working at the end to compile it and stuff like that. But you also need to get that package, that artifact at the end. And you need to be able to use it on any node that will be needed. And you don't want to have your repository just take three terabytes. So the disk space also matters. You don't want your repositories to be outside of your own environment because then you will have bandwidth issues with, with many nodes. And you also want to be able to get, have your repository that are reliable, that you know that they will be available. So let's introduce then Pulp. So Pulp is a tool to manage repositories. It can mirror external repositories. It can uh, have local repositories, and it can also copy repositories between, uh, files between repositories. And all of that started with Pulp 1.0, which was only for RPMs. All you could do with that is just uh, do RPM repositories. We have been using that version of Pulp, and yeah, you already had uh, the nice feature of pool like the consumers that allows you to push packages to clients. We, I will <coughs> demo that. And also the REST API was already there. So Pulp is based on a backend with a REST API that you can call to do whatever you want. We see that we, I have never seen anyone using the REST API directly, but it's possible to just use it. So you could build plugins to just uh, use the Pulp API. And then, I think it was two years ago or one year ago, Pulp 2.0 came in. 
And that one was content agnostic. So people were just thinking and saying, okay, we need to do more than just RPMs because People will also need a Docker registry. They will maybe need to put their puppet module somewhere. And now, Pool 2.0 can manage all of that. So you can install plugins. So the RPM plugin, obviously. Then you can have a private puppet forge. You can have a Docker registry. You can uh, upload OS3 packages and Python packages. There is also a work in progress to be able to put also Debian files into pool, <coughs> which would mean that you would get only one interface, one API to upload any content <coughs> into one server. And that's the goal of pool 2.0, is to be really more content agnostic. It does not bring a lot of features for the RPM stuff, but it brings all of the other uh, extensions, which is, Important because if you have one API, I mean, in pool 1.0 was for uh, RPM files and for Debian, if you want the same, you needed a second server that would do just the Debian part of it. And it, there are uh, another tool called aptly that just do that from Debian. But having just one tool is more efficient, especially since Pulp is made of multiple components. And if you, it is possible to scale it to quite a huge size. So you don't want to scale two applications if you can just do the thing with one. Pulp also is part of an ecosystem. It can play with uh, the foreman, with Catello, with Candlepin, and all that group of software to just provide a front end to just update the packages and do all kind of uh, release, ma release management system, which will bring you a front end to Pulp. But in this talk, I will just demo Pulp alone. So I will not demo the front ends. So you will just see the command lines yeah, because it's more fun, of course. And because yeah, I think the Catalo integration is quite recent also, like more than one year ago. But I've never played with that, so I will just demo what I know. So what is Pulp behind all of what I will show you? Pulp is a lot of different components put together. The first component are the workers. They will just pull the jobs that need to be done, do them, and just uh, send the result back. That's one of the parts that you can scale with Pulp. You can define the number of workers, you can have them in another server, and you can just, if you, it depends on what is the usage of your Pulp servers. You have the content storage when you will need some disk space. The database is MongoDB. Then you have Cupid or RabbitMQ to do the communication between the different uh, parts of Pulp. <coughs> You have the REST API, the content serving, and the certificate verification because yeah, Pulp is also a good way to learn or SSL works or certificates works because you can go pretty advanced into that part. And then on the client side, you have three different parts. You have first an administration tool, which is an interface to the REST API. Then you have uh, you can use the Yum consumer, so just use plan by Yum with the pool repositories to just manage your packages. Or you have the pool consumer when you can just push updates, push removal of packages to the different uh, hosts. So pool is made of different components that you can scale. So if you have a pool server that will need to uh, to serve to a lot of nodes, then you will need to scale HTTPD. If you will have to sync a lot from uh, upstream, you will have a lot of different repo uh, packages, then you will probably need to, to work on Mongo. If you have a lot of uploads to Pulp, you will also need to work on Celery. So you can scale any part of Pulp if you need it. Well, and it's it's really needed. I mean, if you start using Pulp and you want to do it in a standalone server, then it will be slow. You have been warned. So let's 
start with pulp admin, which is the command line tool that is provided by pulp. It just does REST API calls. So when it connects, it will connect to pulp, send the REST queries, and just sometimes it will uh, wait for the result, but you can also specify just do the query, uh, launch the task, and just uh, exit. Which means that when you run a pulp admin command, you can just exit it at any time, just press Ctrl C and you will just be back to your shell, but the task will still be running on the pulp side. And it is also extendable to use the <coughs> other extension like Puppet RPM and stuff like that. But let's go for the demo. So I will cheat a bit because I will use Vagrant and Puppet to just boot boot my pulp server. And what does it need then? Well, that bunch of <coughs> modules. So if you, if you read, uh, there is so that, that pulp module that I have taken contains an example in the readme file that show you how, how you can deploy your own pulp. And I just use Vagrant to do that. So the demo is run on a Vagrant box. Uh, for those who do not know Vagrant, it allows you to boot up a VM and to provision it directly and to, to just delete it if you want and then to provision it again. So it's a virtual machine management tool. So everything you will see there we, uh, has run on my laptop on a VirtualBox VM. That also explains why it is slow at certain times. So that's, you need Apple, you need Apache, Concat, MongoDB, Cupid, and some other purpose stuff. And then here we go. So the command to set up the Vagrant box, right, to boot the Vagrant box, is Vagrant top. At this time, I've already the Puppet modules and the Puppet configuration. I will push that to GitHub so you can also do a Vagrant up of your pulp server if you want. So let's go for the Vagrant up at this moment. Vagrant will boot my VM and just install all the packages that are needed by Pulp. It will set up the queuing uh, server, it will set up the Apache server, it will set up uh, the, the Pulp processes also. So at the end of the boot, I will just have a working Pulp server that I will just be able to use. Yeah, it also sets up uh, MongoDB. So in this case, we will just do everything on just one node. But remember that you can just split that up on several nodes if you want. Setting up Apache now. OK, so at this point, I have a pulp server running in like two minutes, two minutes and a an half. I did cheat a bit. But if you want to set it up by hand, like in the 90s, well, it did not exist in the 90s, but you have all the explanation into the pulp manual that I, you can just read them up and just do it by hand if you want or write a chef module if you want. So we have our standalone. Uh, Julien, just one question. It seems that it started, your puppet manifest was starting Gopher D? Yes. Okay. Uh, Gopher D is uh, the, it's used for the consumer daemon. Okay. Does it run on port 70? Sorry? Does it run on port 70? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't think so, yeah. Uh, apparently, yes. What the hell? It may, it may not. and you still running CentOS 3, we are in trouble, right? <laughs> this is a CentOS 7 box, so. So we have a, an empty pulp server ready to process the request, and there is just no repositories on it, so it's just a, a clean pulp. The first step is to log in. How does that work? Then the pulp admin will log into the pulp server and it will uh, create a certificate that will be stored on disk and that will be available for like one week by default. You can tune that, of course. So once I will need to do that once a week <coughs> by default. So and uh, which also means the fact that we use the REST API means that you can do that as any user on any host. So if you want to run the pulp uh, admin 
command into the Jenkins user on the second host, there is absolutely no problem because it's plain West API. It does not run any pull server command, which is also a nice feature, a nice reason to use REST APIs, of course. So you will see the pull comments. Usually there are not small comments. It's always like 100 characters on one comment to do what you need to do, which is also the reason why there are so there are the front ends are there because yeah, if you look at this command, this is I one of the shorter one. So pull admin login the username and the password, which is the default username and the default password. Change them in production. That's a good tip. So let's go. And then uh, pull admin tells me that okay, my certificate will expire on February the fourth. So it means that I will be able to run any pull command as the admin user for one week. The certificates, the logs. You have the API logs that are in the dot pull directory of your own directory for the beginning purposes. So now we are logged in. Let's see some basic usage. Let's first sync an external repository. Uh, in this case, we will sync the CentOS repository, for example, the CentOS 7 repository. And you will see how you create a repository first, and then how you trigger the run on that repository. It has very pull.0 on there. So let's go. The commands become a bit more complex, a bit more long, but this one is still OK. OK. So it starts with pull admin. Then you need to specify the plugin you want to use. So in this case, I want to use the RPM plugin, which will allow me to create Yum repositories. Then which, sex, which, which, which section do I want to use? Well, I want to use the repository section. Uh, there are two sections at that level. You can have the repository or the consumer section, I think. And what do I want to do? I want to create a repository. And I need to give a unique name to that repository. In this case, let's just put CentOS 7 and the, ar the architecture. And then you can add a lot of options, like the feed URL. In this case, it's a mirror on my own laptop, so it's quite fast. And that's a typical example of a pulp comment. Pulp admin RPM repo create, OK. Hopefully, you don't do that every day, but you will see that the command to upload RPMs are also in the same kind. But let's go for that command. So let's just add the uh, repository. OK, it's done. Yeah, it's done. OK, I am really happy that it's done. It was quite quick. Yes, but it's because only the object, the repository object was created. So now we need to tell pool that we want to actually download the packages to sync the repository. That's the command you will use to do the first thing, but also the everyday thing that we will run at night to update your repository and get the latest CentOS updates. OK, let's, let's go. Then Pulp will start to download not only the RPMs of, of the repositories, it will also get the distribution objects, so the kernels, the initerd files, and all that kind of stuff. The errata also are downloaded, so you can also play with erratas. So in this case, it's downloading a, a CentOS 7 repository, only the base <coughs> repository. And at the end, I will just be able to use that repository with any Yum client. No need to install the plugin, uh, the pulp packages on the clients. You can obviously have a pulp agent on the clients, but this is really not needed. So this is plain. It will create a plain Yum repository. So it's... With, uh, groups? Sorry? Uh, yes. It, uh, it also supports groups, and also uh, the pull consumer can pull pa can push packages, but also groups. So it can do a package install, package removal, but also group install and group removal. I'm personally not a fan of groups, 
But the, the, pulp, the pulp team is, uh, they are a fan of groups because when you read the manual, it's group install pulp server and so yeah. But I am not a big fan of them. Okay, so it has downloaded the distribution files and now it will publish the RPMs. What does that step mean? It means that it will create a lot of sim links into the HTTP directory to, with the different RPMs that are available which is an important feature. It is not the last time I will tell that in that presentation. This is one of the reasons why we choose to pulp, because it creates sim links. So you can have 10 times the same repositories, but you will only have one copy of each RPM into your disks. So you will save a lot of disk space. <coughs> so now we can just browse our pulp repositories and see that indeed there is the CentOS 7 repositories inside it just a lot of RPMs and you have the repo data that is also there so it's really a Hume repository okay that's nice but that one I can just do it with ReposSync, with Ersync, with mRepo, with any other tools that manage Hume repositories Yes, that's true. For the moment, there is nothing really new, nothing fancy, except a few things. For example, each RPM has been read by Pulp, and you can now search into that database. So you can search for uh, a RPM that has that checksum, that has that name. You can find the, the, the build dates. You can get a lot of information out of that content. And the second part is that you can now also create your own repositories. So if you build your own RPMs or if you, if you rebuild RPMs, there are a lot of companies that do that. They take RPMs, they remove all the dependency that they do not want and they just rebuild the RPM. Then you need your own repositories. And why don't you put them on the same way that you, pull, you have your other repositories? So, we will see now how, how you can upload the RPM that you have built to the pulp server. So once again, we use the pulp admin comment. We still use the RPM, obviously the RPM uh, plugin. We will create the repo repository and we will just give it a name. And that's it, we have a new repository it has no packages for the moment, but let's fix that. Let's fix that. Let's just add one RPM. <coughs> I have a Puppet Explorer RPM that I have just built and I will just add it to my repository. <coughs> then, this is maybe one of the things that disturb me the most about Pulp is that you have twice the name RPM into the comment. But it's logical because when you know what is this, it starts to be really logical. Pulp admin RPM because I use the RPM plugin, I will work on the repos, I will upload, yes, but what will I upload? A RPM, an errata, a, a source RPM, so I will upload just an RPM, which comes from the file Puppet, Puppet Explorer, and then I need to specify to which repository I want to update that RPM. Okay, let's go. Up, uploading the RPM, running some stuff on it, indexing the RPM. That's it. Now the package is into the repository. But the repository has not been published yet. So if you need to upload 10 RPMs, then you need to publish them at the end. So for the moment, like it's a new repository, it's not even into my Apache listing. So let's go, let's publish the repository. You can spend some time just uploading your RPMs and oh, why doesn't you see them? Yeah, you clean all, you update, oh no, what's the problem? Yeah, it's just because it is not published. When you sync a repository, uh, it's automatically published at the end of the sync, but not when you upload an RPM, because you might need to upload all the dependency bec before you want to publish your repository. Yes? But 
you say you have the, the, the repo synced, it will automatically publish them. Yes. Is it then also possible to have multiple versions? Say, for example, now our build is for the dev systems is, uh, is the latest updates on last yeah, week. I will we want all systems to be on last week and not the system installed today. Yeah, to I will show, I will uh, talk about that at the end of the, in the advanced, advanced use cases. Okay. And, um, one more sub question. Yes. Uh, when the sync is done, can you, is it picking up all packages or can you also specify it to only pick up the latest? to save disk space on the uh, I do not remember that one. So I will need to check out that. So let's go to publish a repository. There is only one repository, uh, one RPM there, so it's fast. And now you can just use the packages we have uploaded just using uh, uh, Yum because it's served by Apache, no UF the repository and you have the package that's there. But then you want to do something more, more fancy. And you want to play with external repositories, but not the CentOS one, but maybe Ipple one or uh, the ClusterFS one in this case, or Puppet Labs or Project well. There are so many Yum repositories into the, the web that, yeah. So what we will do is we will create an upstream repository what will it be used for? We will put on that repository all the RPMs that we take from the internet and that we do not touch. But we will get that, that RPMs from another repository. So we will fetch the GlusterFS repository in this case and then you, we will move the package that we are interested to to the upstream repository. So let's go. We will first create the GlusterFS repository Once again, pull pamin RPM repo create. Let's pick a fancy name. Then let's just update it with the feed URL of the GlusterFS repository. So instead of doing all of that in one command line, I just use it the Yum repo update instead of create. There are a lot of parameters that you can tune. For example, the number of uh, parallel uh, downloads that you want to make when you sync, but also the relative URL compared to the pull repos into your uh, Apache server. Okay, but in this case, just use uh, Gluster FS7 and use the upstream Gluster repository just. Okay, now the third thing, is obviously to sync. You know, each time the same start of the command pull padmin rpm repo. In this case, sync run. The reason why it is sync run and not just sync is that you, end, you have the run action, but also the status action. Because when you run the command, you can just press <coughs> Ctrl C at any moment and just resume your status view on that sync. But the sync will continue behind the scenes like this. Okay, this command can be exited. Okay, let's exit it and then let's just do reposing status. Okay, and then I am back to my initial view of the, sync, the current sync. Okay, task succeeded. So now I have the GlusterFS repository into my pulp server. It's a small repository. It contains 12 RPMs, that's why I choose that one. So let's go now to create just the upstream repository when I recopy the RPMs that I am interested in. So the same pull admin RPM repo create. Okay, so now I have an empty upstream repository and a GlusterFS repository. And now we will do the hard work to copy the RPM to the GlusterFS repository. That one is a long comment. So it always starts pulp admin RPM repo. But this one, what do I want to do? I want to copy the uh, RPM. 
from the Gluster 7 repository to my upstream repository. And then I will need to specify which packages I want or I will just put all of the packages. But in this case, I will put the glusterfs devil packages into my upstream repository. And for that, I will use the match uh, option and I will say, okay, push the packages that match the name equal gluster devil. And the last option is the, um, a very important uh, option is the recursive. It means that Pulp knows the content of the RPMs. So it also knows the dependency and what package provides. And in this case, we will say, okay, push that package, but also all of its dependencies into that source repository. So in the case of Gluster, I will be able to just by one command put GlusterFS and all the things that, all the packages that I will need to install together with that package to the different nodes. So let's go, let's put, let's copy all the GlusterFS packages, GlusterFS devil packages into my upstream repositories. Okay, it's done. And what do I see? I have indeed the GlusterFS devil packages that has been co uh, copied to my upstream repository, but also the dependencies. So I will, I should just be able to when you install GlusterFS devil. Yeah, just one question. Um, the only advantage of doing that uh, in comparison with the manual way of just air syncing content or using just reposting and encrypting, <coughs> does that mean, that, for example, if you have a consumer that just needs Gluster and not be able to package, uh, to download packages from Apple, it will still be able to install Gluster with just a minimum package from Apple in that specific repository? Yes. Okay. If there is no dependency on Apple, but. Well, normally uh, it will automatically check. It doesn't. It doesn't do cross. Uh, no. Check. No. So yeah. So it doesn't. That's exactly the same thing as reposting them. Yeah, maybe. But I don't know if reposting uses also sim links, and you can maybe not uh, do such advanced queries into uh, reposting. You can do some. If you want, for example, to delete all the RPMs that have been built more than one month ago or stuff like that. Then, uh, you can do like. The, just the latest one or the, the two latest package for, for if you have 10, 10 versions of the same package in the same yeah. cluster. Except, yeah, you don't have the, the other PKI solution and no need for MongoDB. And reposting doesn't have the ability to upload your own packages to the repositories, does it? Uh, no, no. Then you need to use create repo and. Create repo yeah. Really, yeah. But in this case, you just a pull admin client that can just. You can also add uh, packages to, uh, if I want to add packages to the CentOS substream repository, I can also do it which in a quite easy way. So in this case, I have the upstream uh, repository that contains then the GlusterFS devil package. So what is the advantage of, of having the upstream repository is that I will not have time, time, uh, 10 Yum repositories on the clients, just that repository and uh, the CentOS upstream repositories, for example. And I will just pick the packages I need into these repositories. Because, yeah, remember, the clusterfs uh, repository contains 12 RPMs, and in that case, I just have five RPMs into that repository. So there is a bunch of options that we have there. So the from repo ID, the two repo ID, which are quite easy. And then you can uh, search for the RPMs with a lot of different options, like greater than or less than, or just match. So if I want to only have the RPMs that were built uh, after, since last week, I can just use build date, greater than, uh, one, week, one week ago, stuff like that. And the recursive dependencies copy is also nice, especially when you use EPL, because yeah, in EPL, uh, basically EPL doesn't rely on any other repository except the base repositories, which means that if I use a recursive uh, on a copy from a, on a package from EPL, I know that uh, I will just be able to end the, to end the UM install after that. While 
It could be that the Gluster FS packages require some packages from Apple that I would then have to <coughs> copy manually because uh, Pool does not do cross, cross uh, repository checks. Okay. But no, remember, I did not publish my upstream repository yet, so let's just do that. Unless this time just when the dash dash bg uh, option, which will just r directly run into the background. So th this command line is will not be blocking. Okay. Okay, and now I know that the pulp server uh, uh, will be running when you will have some time, will be running my uh, publishing task. And this time it's, uh, there is nothing happening in the server, so it will just do it directly. Yeah. Yes? Is that just a copy, or is Pulp now aware that there's a link between the clusters repo and the upstream? So when the cluster gets updated, the upstream gets automatically no. updated, or you have to recopy it? Recopy. You have to recopy. Because you could do that from five repositories, so... Well, that would be happy that he knows, okay, he passed files from that repository and... Yeah, and but it, it is not the case. So I have added the BG flag to run in the background, and then I will see what happens on that pool server. So I will just make the list of the task. In this case, it is not a plugin, so it is like the login command, just the first in the list. So that is actually the shortest pulp command that you will see today, pulp admin tasks list. You can get the details of the task and you can also cancel the tasks uh, if you wish. Well, only uh, not the finished task, but the other tasks, you can just cancel them. So let's go. Just leave the task and you see my that the last task will just be published on the upstream 7 repository and it's successful. That is also a, a problem due to the nature of pulp admin is that uh, sometimes you run a pulp a comment and for some reason do you have a DNS error into the middle of the comment and so the task is still continuing on the pulp side but the pulp admin will just exit with a, a wrong error code but Behind the scene, pulp is still running the task and it might be successful Why the pulp admin command might have exited after a bunch of seconds due to uh, an external cause. But in this case, I run the pulp admin command in a non-blocking mode, so... Okay, so the publish was successful, so I can just uh, set up my clients. Just like any Yum repository, using Puppet, using anything I want. In this case, well, the repository, I have added them in a magic way. And I will install the packages that I have added into my Earthstream repository. And I do not have the Gluster repository into the, that node. So let's run the Yum install. Blah, 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 blah. Voilà, hop. Just like any repo, uh, RPM, and it just comes from the, my upstream repository. Okay, that was for the quite basic usage of Pulp. Now let's go a bit more advanced. Let's start with the Pulp consumers. So it's kind of a Pulp agent, so it needs to run on the clients. And yeah, it will allow Pulp to push updates. So I have never used that in production, but I wanted to show it to you because I think it's an interesting feature for people that have a lack of uh, orchestration tool. Yeah, because it's all of that is, it's just an orchestration, an orchestration tool that just acts on packages. The first step is to uh, register the pulp consumer into the pulp server. So for that, you need to be root because it <coughs> will need to copy files into uh, slash etc for the, the certificates. And it's not the pulp admin command, it's the pulp consumer command. Okay, let's log in as the admin user on the pulp server and let's register. And I need to give my own ID. In this case, I just give the host name. 
Okay, let's go. Enter your password. Yeah, you don't have to enter the password into the command line if you don't want to, obviously. Okay, so this consumer is now registered into the pulp, into the pulp server. So pulp will be able to communicate with it, and will be able to do anything that's needed. Like uh, this node will report the list of the installed packages to the pulp server, I think, and pulp server will be able to push updates. So let's go. We will first need to tell uh, pulp that that specific uh, uh, consumer can use the upstream repository and that it needs to set up the repository. So that will just set up a pulp.conf into the yum.conf.d directory that will contain the enabled repository for that specific consumer. OK, let's go then. So the repo, uh, I will use the RPM uh, plugin, but I will use the consumer and not the repo command, and I will bind the consumer, uh, pulp.sendwaysdojo.org, to the repo ID upstream 7. OK. OK, task succeeded, which means that now my pool consumer is aware that he can access that upstream repository. And now I can just push the installation of that cluster FS uh, package. This is from the pulp server. In this demo, everything is on the same host, but this is, you can just run that on every server that has access to the pulp admin and just do that for any consumer that has been approved by pulp. The certificate of the consumer do not expire. You can revoke them, but they do not expire after a week like the login here. Yeah, hopefully, yes. OK, so consumer package. What do I want to do? I want to install. And I want to run the installation, so not check the status of the cluster devel package on that consumer ID. So uh, the interesting part there is install because you can install, you can remove, you can uh, update, you can also group install, group remove, and group update. <coughs> Let's go. So you have the detail of what Hume is doing, and at the end, okay, you get the list of the packages that have been set it up on that node. That was the first use case. The second use case is I will not demo it, but you can have kind of pulp nodes, so parent and child nodes that can share contents and just uh, replicate the repositories. So if you have different data centers, you can have a pulp node in each data center. And let's go, let's come to that repository matrix. So in this case, we have the CentOS, CentOS updates and uh, repositories that we put on every environment. <coughs> then an internal uh, repository that will contain package that we built. You have then the Upstream repository that we have built, and then you have a bunch of other repositories. And what does that mean? It means that I want the CentOS, in the internal and the Upstream repositories everywhere, in every environment, and with several versions, which means that I will have one CentOS dev on a uh, repository, one sent to us UAT repository, and one sent to us production repository, which means that when I will know that the, the sent to us packages are not working or do not break my application, I will, I will promote the repository. So I will create an empty repository and I will just copy all the RPMs of the current repository into that uh, dev repository. Once that works, I will just go to the UAT repository and the same for productions. Yes? Just one question. So is that a kind of, well, you can to, uh, compare that to doing a snapshot of a repository? Yes. And then you are, for each phase, for sync, dev, UAT, prod, you're just taking the same version, I mean, when you approve it? Yes. OK. So when you know that your acceptance tests are OK, mm -hmm. that there is nothing that will break into uh, the, not only the CentOS repositories, but also into the external repositories, that, for example, the new version of Munin will not break your infrastructure, then you just upgrade all the repositories. And, and 
and suppose that well, I, I've worked in, in companies where the UIT test is quite a long phase. So you need to keep multiple versions of the CentOS update repository because Dev is, start, is already started working on another version and they want latest update applied. So do you, is yeah. it possible to have multiple versions, like a, a daily, a, a frozen version? Well, this is not a feature of Pulp. It is a way of working with Pulp. Okay. So you can name the repositories, copy them to a date named repository if you wish. So it's not a feature of Pulp, it's just uh, the way we use it. And uh, it also means that if you need multiple uh, CentOS updates, one per day, you will only have the disk space of the RPM that have changed during that day. So you will have a full copy of... Uh, uh, what, I've, what I've done in the past well, was... I, I need to take care of what I would say because I see that all is done is there. But I was just doing LVM snapshot for that. You know, it doesn't consume just the, 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 ch the, the change. But I was, I was able to, I was able to, to just have a specific repository running for a long time between all the sync, dev, UAT, and production. So yeah, a press snapshot is also an option. The same thing. Sorry, it's another way of doing. Yes. The same thing okay. And there is a. The third-party repositories, we just don't want to have them available into DevUAT and production. So we don't have 10 .repo files because uh, when you have them, you never remove them. So yeah, so we just keep the, the, the few uh, .repo files that are there and we cherry pick the interesting RPM from the other repositories. That's what, yes? If you cherry pick them, you deal the dependencies with them. Yes. Automatically. Well, if you, if you use the dash dash recursive option uh, when you copy the RPM. So, you have one copy of each repo per environment. You can promote a repository like it was a package. So, you can do yum update dash y safely if you have good tests. Huh? And like Pulp does not copy the, the RPMs, you will only get one copy. One more thing is that you will need to sometimes clean the offline RPMs that are no longer in the repository. So clean will actually, uh, Pulp will actually remove them from disks. So that's the, a way of working with Pulp that's interesting if you want to ensure to get the latest version of each package but without breaking your uh, your servers. Just, just a note about that. It means that you need to be on the same file system, right? Because you use hard links. So no, it's it symlinks. Okay. It, it is not hard links, it's symlinks, so... Okay, so it, it doesn't use hard links, okay? No. Okay. It uses symlinks and then it tunes the Apache configuration to allow the symlinks to... But yes, it's only symlinks. Okay. Well, for example, the problem with Arlings is to find where, where is the originator file, the, fir the first file. You need to use a find command to do that and so <coughs> just symlinks because it's easier and it does not make any difference. So conclusion, Pulp obviously manage repositories. This is made of many components that you can scale, you can tune. It can do more than just RPM if you need a Docker registry, if you need if you need a RPM repository and a Docker registry, then you can start with Pulp without any problem. It's based on a REST API. A bunch of disadvantages. I wish you're Mongo because if you're getting into troubles and you will need to run some Mongo stuff. We, have, we had a lot of bugs with it in the past, but we were really early users. So the migration between the several versions of Pool did not always went really great. We will find a bunch of bugzilla bugs about uh, our migrations. And uh, yeah, the CLI are really long, like my two lines of command line. Yeah, it's kind of a disadvantage if you are not used to it. But it used Simlinx to save the disk space, which was the main reason why we started investigating into Pulp because also if you take a snapshot, then you'll also need some more disk, disk space also. Uh, it can combine the mirroring of repositories and your own repositories. You can run multiple tasks at the same time and you can run them in an asynchronous way. You can scale it and there is a REST API if you want to 
have your own client or to write a nice Jenkins plugin? If you want, yes, please do. Okay, that's it. So you have github.com slash pulp. They have quite a good documentation. Uh, there is two documentation actually, the pulp documentation and the pulp RPM documentation. There is also a quite active mailing list if you need support or help. And voila. If you have any other questions? Please, uh, in your disadvantages, you said it was slow. Yes. Uh, slow by default, I mean. So it means that you really need, you cannot just say, I will pull, use my pulp server, like one in a single server, because you will need to tune your, a bit your uh, database. You will maybe tune the number of threads and yes. So to get it, to get it fast, it's database tuning and add more servers? It, it, <laughs> it depends on how you use the your pool server. Some of the people will just uh, scale just Apache because it's Apache the problem. Some people will just need more bandwidth, so it depends. But if you run it on a small VM, it will be really slow if you start cloning uh, all the CentOS and Apple and repositories. Yes. Are there any any big advantages over Spaceflow? Because as far as I see, it's very very. Simple. It is. It will be part of the new Red Hat satellite also. Yeah, so I, I know, but uh, I'm kind of surprised that I, I already know about the announcement about the new satellite, but that Red Hat is leaving actually Spacewalk, which was kind of a good product and puts its effort in both, which is basically a copy of the repository management of Spacewalk. Well, the only direct answer I've seen for now is just that Pulp will also support Docker registry, which I think is something that mm -hmm. Red one also wants to support, but I don't work at Red so for that kind of but questions. No, I don't really see the added value to go over to Pulp. But I know that Red Hat has direction. If you compare Pulp with just um, Spacewalk, yeah, you see, that's what I'm doing, you know. You're yeah. subscribing machine to channels, and that's yeah, yeah, what you're doing. If you have a big overview, you know. Do you consider that Spacewalk is a configuration management system? No, no, but... It, it was part. when it was invented. Yeah, you, but you I don't use that part. Yes, yeah. obviously. <laughs> and then the, the answer to that part of the problem really, uh, was that you had several teams working on different things. Pulp was just for the repository management. But not also from software, but also uh, Pulp, uh, um, um, Puppet Manifest Modules. Because on the other, on the other hand, it integrates in this new satellite version, you have also Cadella, a Catello, and you have also a uh, candle pin for subscription management, mm -hmm. and also Roman for node classifier for Puppet and Puppet Adwords. So you have to see that as a whole, and not that just, Pulp is just a, the um, one part of the, the complete solution to replace uh, Spacewalk. Mm -hmm. And if you need all those things, yeah, you see that Spacewalk was designed for the 90s. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> plus probably depends on where you come from. If you just need yes. a repository manager, you can but if I needed the repository manager and somebody showed me Spacewalk, I would love it. I just said, well, go away. I want something smaller. So that probably is the answer to that then. OK. So I'm uh, wondering what is uh, used <coughs> to solve the redundancies uh, on the server. Do you know if there is some library used or just implemented in part? Uh, I don't get uh, You know, uh, you, you showed that uh, dependencies are also uh, Sync. So, what is uh, used for solving the dependency chain in RPM? It's just uh, into the RPM files. That's all. It just use what the contents okay. into the metadata of the RPMs, and then it's everything is stored into the MongoDB, and then it just query the, the DB to do that. Okay. Thank you. <coughs>